Hello and welcome to this talk in the Fienerob Interdisciplinary Lecture Series. My name is Thomas Döring. I'm leading the Agroecology and Organic Farming Group at the University of Bonn. And today I'm talking about how to conduct agronomic field trials. In doing so, um, there will be some recurring questions throughout my talk. One is how large should a field trial actually be? And the other one is can modern technology help with conducting such field trials? So what is agronomy if we want to uh, conduct agronomic field trials? Agronomy is the science of soil management and crop production or crop cultivation. And my talk will be structured around seven steps for the design and implementation of agronomic field trials. First of all, we will look at the ways in which we formalize agronomic questions. Then there are a number of steps with the design, concerned with the design and um, potential problems of such field trials. Um, we will look at replication and randomization, at potential um, difficulties arising through edge effects and artifacts. We will need to place the trial at or in a field. We will then, when the trial is implemented or established, uh, then we will need to protect the trial from damage through uh, weeds, for example, or birds. Um, we will also have a look at the um, potential workload that arises through doing such a field trial. And finally, we will need to uh, look at um, the need to repeat the trial in other environments. So finally then I'm going to come back to these focus questions about trial size and the help of technology. So let's first look at the first step, formalizing the agronomic question. So what could um, an agronomic question be? Um, I've listed here a few example questions. One could be what is the best fertilizer type and dose? for obtaining high maize yield. And what we now need to do um, is to allocate response variables and explanatory variables that correspond to a statistical model to this question. So here it's very easy to see that the explanatory variables are the fertilizer type and dose and the response variable in this case is just the maize yield. Here's another example. So we've got the question, what is the optimal combination of tillage, straw management and uh, cover crop species to, in order to reduce nitrogen losses? And in this case, I've also color um, coded the response variables. So this is the different nitrogen types of nitrogen losses and the explanatory variables. In this case, there are several tillage, straw management and the identity of the cover crops and the different combinations of them are then tested in the field trial. And here's an even more complex one, um, an agronomic question, which wheat variety is best suited as mixture partner with P to obtain high wheat and P yield. And in this case, again, I've highlighted the response variables in green and the explanatory variables in blue. So when we formalize these agronomic questions and translate them into response variables and explanatory variables, then um, we would have, for example, as a response variable yield or other variables such as nitrogen losses or uh, water use efficiency. Um, but the important point here to note is that the observational unit for obtaining such measurements is the plot. This is very important. Uh, I've shown here um, a trial map uh, or an aerial picture of uh, a, a field trial and one of these plots is just highlighted there. With the explanatory variables we also have to clarify a bit of terminology. So the trial factor um, is basically the explanatory variable um, and has several levels. Uh, at least two. Yeah? So there's a, um, in this case, in this example, we've got a fertilizer dose with as the trial factor and this has three levels, 0, 60 and 120 kilograms of nitrogen 
per hectare. We can also have, as we've seen in the previous examples, two or more different trial factors and then we are especially inter uh, interested in the interactions between these factors. So the question, does the response variable depend in any way um, on the combination of these different factors? Does the response to one factor depend on the level of any other factor? So in this case, for example, variety and fertilizer, they would um, interact if that is the case. As in the examples before that I've mentioned uh, with the questions, uh, with the agronomic questions, there can be uh, also two or more different uh, trial factors integrated in the same field trial. And when we're doing that, we are particularly interested in interactions between these trial factors, which means that we want to know does the response variable, or in this case, does the response to one factor, for example, the fertilizer, depend on the level of any other factor, for example, variety. So as a first approximation for answering the question about trial size, this is, in this case, simply the product of the number of plots and the size of the plot. So let's first have a look at the plot size. So obviously um, there's a dependence on, of the plot size on the available machinery. When we are looking at the possibility of conducting field trials at farm scale, then we are probably using such a farm scale machinery, such as this combine harvester um, with several uh, dozens of meters uh, width with, with which uh, the, the trial would then be harvested or we're conducting a smaller field trial with this special machinery, a combine harvester specially built for trials, for agronomic field trials. But with this we also need to consider the minimal width and the standard or um, the typical length that is used to accommodate the um, needs of that machine. So in this case uh, with this um, combine harvester for, um, for field trials we would have a width of 1.5 meter and a typical length of 10 to 12 meters. So as we said the trial size very much depends on the plot size but also on the number of plots and this in turn depends on the question of replication. So let's look at this example. We've got um, one observation from a fertilized plot and one observation from an unfertilized plot. And although this might give a first indication of the difference between fertilized and unfertilized, it really um, is not very satisfying because in this unreplicated situation, we have no information on the variability within the treatment. So what we call or could call a treatment effect could also just be random. So the purgative uh, treatment effect is actually no effect at all, perhaps. So the field trial size very much depends on the number of plots and also the plot size. So let's now look at the number of plots and this in turn depends on the question of replication. So let's have a look at this example. We've got here the situation of one plot being fertilized and another plot being unfertilized. But in this unreplicated situation, there's actually no information available on the variability within the treatment. So what we might call a treatment effect could just be a random effect because we just don't know whether this difference between fertilized and unfertilized is actually due to the fertilizer treatment or not. So maybe this situation is slightly better where we've got several observations for each of the treatment with four plots allocated to the fertilized situation and four plots allocated to the unfertilized situation. But if uh, we have got a situation like this where the underlying soil um, quality is very different, um, indicated here by these uh, different zones of, of the soil quality, then um, we've got another problem in this pseudo-replicated situation 
there's some information available on the variability within the treatment, but the treatment effect can actually not be separated from the variability um, of the soil, from the underlying variability. So basically the treatment effect is confounded by other factors. And an important thing to notice here is that these other factors might completely be unknown. So therefore, what we're doing normally in field trials is that we are randomizing um, our plots. In this case, in this replicated and randomized situation, there's information uh, on the variability within the treatment present. And also the treatment effect can be separated from the underlying soil variability. So um, to come back to the question of the field trial size, in a second approximation, we can say that the trial size is a product of the number of factor levels and the replications, the number of replications and the size of each plot. So this brings us to the question of how many replicates are needed. And to answer that question, we've got a very powerful instrument available, which is called a power analysis. And the idea behind a power analysis is that you set a certain error probability and usually that is 20%. Um, and the error is in not detecting a true difference between, let's say, different treatments. That will obviously depend on the variability in the data. So the more variable the data is, the less likely you will detect a true difference. So let's look at this example of faba bean yields that we um, investigated in a, a field trial a few years ago. So, and in this power analysis, we found that to detect a 10% difference between faba bean yields between the treatments, we would need a total of 24 replications. And that is quite a lot compared to what is actually done in practice of agronomic science. So in this analysis of 50 different papers, the uh, most frequent numbers of replicates in the field trials were, was three or four. And you can then ask yourself, how much of a difference would you detect with that kind of replication, with four replicates, for example, and then about 30% yield difference would be detectable with that kind of replicate. Um, number. So a lot larger than the 10% um, by these 24%, uh, 24 replicates. So as I said before, replication is very much needed, but not enough because we also need randomization. So what is randomization and how do you actually randomize? So um, randomization means that the treatments are randomly allocated to the different plots. But if you follow this randomization completely randomly and very strictly, then you could well, up, well end up with a situation where all the plots of one treatment lie in one corner and all the other treatments lie in another corner. So we would not be able to separate the treatment effects from any confounding effector factors underlying um, the trial in terms of, for example, soil heterogeneity. So this is one possible outcome of the randomization process, but it's completely unsuitable to detect any difference between the treatments in a reliable way. So here's another example that might be a bit better suited, but I would still call it unsuitable. Um, so it is a possible result of the randomization process, but um, it still has some uh, connectivity, spatial connectivity between uh, some of the treatments um, that is too high for uh, actually detecting the treatment effects against any confounding factors. So what we need is um, plots that are um, allocated to different treatments in a non-regular way rather than a random way. And one way to help with this non-regularity is to use different blocks. Um, in this case, we've got four blocks and within each of the four blocks, the different treatments are allocated to the plots. And even there, however, 
we need to check whether there's any undesired regularity. So especially with a low number of different treatments, for example, if we've only got two or three or even four different treatments, then just strictly following randomization would perhaps lead us to undesired plot designs. So we need to check for any regularity. But a randomization also um, depends a bit on the trial factors that we are investigating. So some trial factors are actually quite difficult to randomize, especially at small scale. Um, these include, for example, tillage or irrigation. So you can imagine that when dealing with such a big farming um, implement here, that it's difficult to have small plots turn around here with that machine and uh, follow this randomization. So um, a solution to that is only to make the plots bigger, not to give up randomization, of course. Yeah. So we actually cannot do without replication and not without randomization. Another problem that we have to deal with when designing field trials can be summarized under the heading of edge effects or artifacts. So one problem there is that there might be undesired interactions between the plots of different treatments. So because these um, plants in these plots compete for light, water and nutrients, the this neighbor will affect this plot and it will have a different effect than this one. And therefore, um, the um, treatments are not independent of each other. Um, also, um, other similar problems occur when there are pathogens or pests spreading from one plot to the next or when there's fertilizer leakage from one plot to another one. So one possibility to minimize such interactions is to have um, like wider margins around the plots and also to have these guard plots around the whole trial to protect them from outside interference. So in this case, uh, in this example, we have decided to implement very wide buffer strips between different blocks of that trial. Uh, the Wide Synergies project that uses a total field size, trial size of 249 by 59 meters is uh, using these 20 wide, 21 meter wide buffer strips to minimize the interactions that come from insects traveling from one plot to another one. Another problem that we have to deal with and that affects the plot size and also therefore the trial size is that throughout the season we are doing destructive measurements within the plot, for example harvesting biomass. Uh, obviously, in this case, uh, on the left, it's not so ideal because area there um, very much depends on the um, outer areas. So uh, there's a big edge effect, so it's not representative of the whole plot. So this situation is better, but we need also to consider that we do several measurements throughout the season and therefore a lot of the plot area is already lost by these destructive measurements. So basically that means that uh, we need to make the plot size as big as reasonable. Um, and we also have learned that we probably need to make the number of replicates um, possibly quite large. So that in total means that the trial size uh, would benefit from being large. Also another factor that uh, increases the trial size is the inclusion of guards, guard plots. In terms of um, the destructive me measurements that um, necessitate a large uh, plot size, um, we can perhaps counteract that by using non-destructive measurements. I've shown here some examples of what can be used for non-destructive measurements. There are lots and lots of examples and um, although we might actually not be able to reduce the plot size. At least what we are more likely to achieve that is that we're getting more data from the same plot size. Here uh, are a few recent examples of publications that 
elaborate on the use of such non-destructive measurements. So because of these edge effects, artifacts and interactions between the plots, we've got another aspect to consider in the design of field trials, which is that the more complex and diverse the cropping systems become that we want to investigate, the more difficult is the actual trial design. And also the larger is the field trial size that we need to accommodate such uh, complexity and diversity. Here's an example from a rice cultivar mixture in China, where one cultivar, a glutinous rice, is mixed with another one. And here the actual interaction between the uh, two different rice cultivars is actually needed and part of the uh, study. And that would be compared against the two different rice cultivars in monoculture each and respectively. But you can immediately see that this would be requiring quite a large plot size to actually accommodate all this uh, interaction that goes in and goes on and between the different cultivars. Here's another more extreme example from agroforestry. So you've got um, here a situation where um, farm-sized agroforestry plots would need uh, combine harvester and actually drive between the alleys of the trees. And that means that the necessary plot size is already very, very large to actually investigate whether agroforestry systems are any better or any different from the respective monoculture situations. And you can even get more complex than that. For example, here in a permaculture situation here on in tropical agroforestry, where it becomes very, very difficult to design a field trial of reasonable size around this uh, around these systems. So basically that means the more complex and more diverse the system that we want to investigate, the larger the trial. The next question is then um, where we are going to put our trial once we have decided how large it should be. And we are facing two different problems um, when um, placing the field trial. One is that we want to minimize the influence of neighboring crops and landscape features on the trial, for example, of hedges or roads or field margins. And the reason is that there's a directional influence from these features that might then confound the treatment effects so that we cannot separate um, the treatment effects from any other incoming effects from outside. And the second problem is that there might be some underlying heterogeneity of the soil or the relief. So that might be slopes. Usually we would select a field that has no slopes, that is completely even. Um, but sometimes we cannot avoid that there is underlying heterogeneity of the soil. And this is an extreme example where there is quite a lot of heterogeneity in the soil that um, is visible here through the different crop growth, um, because there are different colors um, of the crop. There are two different uh, alternative solutions to that problem. One is to stay within a homogeneous area or to select a field that is completely homogeneous, uh, such as this one here, although we might not be completely sure that the actual area is uh, entirely homogeneous. Um, so the other possibility is to actually use that heterogeneity. Um, this example here shows how to do that. We would use a longer shape of the trial and then have a very long plot along which we would take several measurements so that we straddle these different soil types and um, make sure that we notice and study the interaction between the treatment and the underlying soil heterogeneity. Of course this trial design here means that probably we will not be able to integrate so many different treatments because the necessary plot size is quite large. So in total that means that for the trial size, the larger the trial, the more likely there will be any heterogeneities underlying. So you can imagine if you want have a trial size that actually is much larger than this, four, five, ten times as large as this, then it will be very difficult to actually fit it into that um, area into that field without having some heterogeneity of the soil.
So um, there's therefore a limit to how large the si uh, trial size could be. And um, usually this is also the reason why you find um, uh, trials, uh, field trials in um, on soils that are very, very homogeneous. Whether this is actually um, then representative of our entire um, agricultural situation is another question. So given these um, problems with the heterogeneity, it becomes very important to actually map and quantify the underlying soil heterogeneity. And one possibility arising through uh, novel uh, technical developments is uh, illustrated here. So geoelectric measurements with a mobile uh, gamma spectrometer or portable x-ray fluorescence. Um, and I recommend that you have a look at this video by Daniel Pfarr, who uh, works on these areas. But there's also another completely different alternative, um, where uh, the, the actual trial, when it's uh, relatively large, is not placed within one field, but is placed in many different fields. So this approach um, involves then many farmers fields. In this case here, um, um, the authors say that the treatments were not replicated at each farmer's fields, but the farmer's fields were used as replications. So that means that we have got many, many different fields where in each field there are the different treatments, but within this field there's no a proper replication. And another example for this approach is shown here where we used um, 24 different farms um, to uh, compare different legume mixtures against each other. Uh, you can see here a slight difference in the colors of green uh, between the left and the right where two different treatments of legume mixtures were tried out. So um, when we place the field trial, it is also important to consider time um, because there are potentially important legacy effects of the trial. When we consider this example of the field trial there, again, the trial, um, once it has terminated, um, it, we cannot use the same area for a trial in the next year. Or in fact, it is recommended not to use it for two or three years. Um, so basically the red zone is then forbidden for trialing in the next few years and only after that, after the legacy effects of that trial there have worn off, we can put a trial there again. Now that we've um, established the trial, it is important also to protect it from uh, potential problems. Uh, there might be birds or slugs or insects, diseases, some hares or wild boars that break into the trial or um, pick the uh, grains and eat the seeds and do whatever they like, but um, they basically destroy the integrity of the trial. Uh, there might also be abiotic factors that interfere with the uh, accuracy and the reliability of the data, for example, hail, um, flooding or drought, um, as seen in this case here from a rice experiment in Africa. So there are various ways of protecting the trial to deal with these problems. Uh, for example, such bird nets or fencing or uh, acoustic ways to deter birds. Um, there's also the possibility of irrigation when there's a drought, of course, but then we would have to have anticipated this possibility in the first place. Otherwise, it might be uh, difficult to actually implement it once we, dis once we actually see this problem. So what does that mean for the trial size? Um, the smaller the trial, the easier it is to control, obviously, uh, because the area for netting or for the fences will depend on the trial size. But also it is necessary to consider that the smaller the trial and the more isolated it is, the more it becomes prone to damage to um, particular uh, insects and birds. Another aspect that is very important for planning field trials is the workload, the anticipated workload, so that you can actually make sure that you can uh, 
um, get all the data from all the plots. So our experience at the moment is that we would need a net time of minimally four to five hours per plot across the season for the measurements. That would be a relatively small trial, um, up to perhaps um, more like eight hours per plot. Um, so you can then work out the number of hours that are needed per treatment. And that means that there's a workload limit um, on the number of treatments that you can actually implement in the trial and test in your trial. In addition, what is needed to consider is the um, timing for the planning, for traveling, for sample transport and so on. So these are really only net times for um, the workload. And also what I find very useful is that we consider the time for any unplanned measurements that um, maybe um, are based on some interesting observations that we make throughout the season uh, and that need to be translated into data. So for the trial size that means the larger the number of plots of course the higher the workload and that also then limits our field, uh, sorry, our trial size. Normally um, we would need to um, conduct a field trial not only once in one season and at one place, but in several uh, years and sites. We call this year site combination an environment. So at least we would need three environments to actually uh, make sure that we've got re robust um, results for our um, agronomic question. By doing this, we also reduce the risk of failure um, of the trial and um, an important aspect surely is also to assess the reliability of results in the face of variable weather conditions and that uh, I believe becomes uh, very much important in uh, these days of um, a changing climate. Now given that we have to spend quite a lot of work on each trial and now we also have to replicate the whole trial in different environments the question is, is there any possibility to optimize this? And this brings me back to the uh, tool of the power analysis. And I found one interesting paper where um, the authors compared the power of um, using more replicates or a higher number of sites or a higher number of years. Of course, this is not generalizable in that it depends on the data that they used. In this case, it uh, was a study on rice um, grain yield. But um, this shows that one can work out the uh, optimal way of combining replications and uh, environments. In this case, what they found is that for in increasing the power, it's much more economic to uh, use a higher number of sites, whereas increasing the number of replicates really doesn't help very much in uh, getting more accuracy and more ability to take, detect differences between the treatments. So to conclude, um, I think I've shown that um, in designing a trial, trial size is quite um, a central uh, number that uh, is in the end a compromise between several factors that have to be taken into account, including interaction between the different plot, the number of treatments and the number of replications and so on. Uh, also the workload is very important to determine the trial size, but that also technical devices can actually help us with the field trials and also can help us to uh, basically reduce some of these trade-offs that we um, need to deal with when finding a compromise for the trial size. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.